Am I on? I'm on. I'm definitely on. Do I have a clicker I can use? Sorry, I entered the stage without it. Before I, I kick off, I just feel after such a really moving and an important testimonial, like I am um, difficult not to feel that what I'm going to be talking about seems a little bit superficial. Uh, so I think I, I'd just like to add a little bit of context. This is about um, marketing. And of course, hopefully every company will feel that their, the product they're marketing is the best solution for a particular disease. Uh, but also the methodology and the approach that I'm talking about uh, are very central to having a much more patient-centric approach. And in fact, I think it's, it's vital to develop uh, uh, a post-authorization uh, work with, with treatments to make sure that uh, we adapt the, the treatments better to the individual patient. So, um, as I said in the program, uh, it said I was an independent advisor, unfortunately, well not unfortunately, but those happy carefree days are over. Uh, I'm now with a company called Puri, uh, and I'll be talking about um, fighting the fear of failure by using uh, data and, and agile approaches to, uh, to communication marketing. So first, a few sentences about Puri. We make uh, health supplements, uh, so you could argue that we're trying to prevent diseases from, from occurring. We're trying to help people uh, live uh, healthy lives. And we have a, a, a small but, uh, but premium product range. Uh, we <clears throat> very much believe in, in a holistic approach to, to uh, nutrition, meaning that um, <clears throat> excuse me, what you eat is only uh, a part of having a healthy life. You need to combine it with, with um, a healthy lifestyle in general. Um, we also believe very, very deeply that uh, consumers should be able to know exactly what they what they eat and take. So we believe in what we call radical transparency. So every product we make, not just every product, but every batch we produce, we get tested by independent third parties to make sure that we don't have uh, any pesticides, uh, uh, any kind of heavy metals or whatever contaminants that uh, uh, modern industrial farming would produce <coughs> left in the products. And so we, we um, benefit from, <coughs> excuse me, from an independent third party called Clean Label um, uh, Project .org that uh, in this case tested 134 different protein powders and uh, ours, I'm proud to say, was, was best in class. So we believe very much in uh, everyone has the right to know what they can do. So very briefly about me. Uh, I've uh, been fortunate or foolish to spend a lot of time in a different, a couple of different industries at the point of their most radical transformation. Uh, all of this caused by digital. I was in the media industry when it went from what was uh, called dead tree media into digital. Super transformation. Uh, everything was turned upside down. Business models were changed. All of a sudden, user-generated content uh, was a was a thing. How how dare they? users also to start using content when publishers were supposed to do that, but they did. And funnily enough, what we saw in that space was uh, uh, quite a few examples of how quickly things can change. At some point in time, MySpace was social media. I don't know if you can remember, but it was social media. There was nothing else. And then from that point, less than 18 months later, they were done. They were out and Facebook had taken over. So I think it's, it's also a testament to Facebook's power that they still uh, remain on top. The music industry, I spent some time just when it went from physical sales to digital sales and from digital sales to subscription. Very, very fun time. Uh, interesting to see that within 18 months, Spotify in Sweden had uh, four times the market share of iTunes, which was by then, at that point, uh, by far the biggest retailer of music in the world. Uh, film, all of you probably know the famous quote from from Blockbuster saying that um, uh, Netflix is not even on our radar, uh, which was uh, two years before they went bankrupt. So very, very uh, quick declines in many of these industries. The book sector has been through the same. Uh, the real revelation in the book sector came with inspiration from the streaming services, subscription models. And then lately I've spent time uh, in health tech um, at Leo Farms Innovation Lab where I was uh, 
head of the incubator, um, which had, which was the early funnel of uh, of developing products. So, enough about me. On to the issue at hand here, which is uh, a fundamental problem in marketing, uh, phrased more than a hundred years ago, uh, still exists to this day. Half the money I spent on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. And uh, and. Uh, then about 40 years ago, some advanced uh, statistical models uh, arrived, helping to, to get some assumptions on board as to how to, to uh, predict uh, and assume what a particular spend would yield. That became more advanced uh, with multi-touch uh, attribution that could take in a lot more data points uh, for, the, for individual uh, consumers of content and communication. Uh, along with that, but uh, on a smaller scale, A-B testing has been also used quite a lot to, to look at the efficiency and basically growth hacking, which is a term that I'll be talking a lot about, a term that's surfaced from, from uh, tech startups. Obviously, tech startups in Silicon Valley had to, when they made a paradigm shift in, in marketing, they had to call it something else, didn't they? And they, hacking was a great thing to put in there and growth was what everyone was looking for. So growth hacking is, is now a term. Growth hacking is basically a, a combination of multi-touch attribution and A-B testing. And then what we're seeing uh, right now as uh, what looks to be uh, the next really important tool, and not just a shiny update, but the next really important tool to have in your marketing toolbox is, um, is uh, machine learning. And uh, I'll be talking a little bit about those two. So um, what's important to understand here is, is um, uh, at the core of trying to be agile is reducing the iteration loop. Now, the, the, the shorter you can have your iteration loop, the lower your risk. It means that uh, you're, you're not building up too much based on hypothesis. You're very quickly trying to test if what you're assuming should be the case would be the case in fact. And I, I presume that most of you either have tried yourself or have in your uh, companies histories of really big, let's say, patient engagement sites that were uh, based on uh, dense reports from McKinsey or Deloitte or, or the like, saying that we need this and that, and then uh, someone went out to a, a vendor and said, uh, I like this in blue, and the vendor said, yes, certainly, uh, left it with a, with a bow on top, but then it turned out that actually what was planned behind a desk didn't work in reality. So, so um, Risk will build over time if you if you don't test, and this is a very common decision-making process we see in most pharma companies around most decisions. Also in in marketing, uh, is is uh, is my experience anyway. Uh, the waterfall decision model: uh, once you pass a gate, uh, you can't return. Which means that as you go along in the development process, you start in the beginning with, uh, this is the McKinsey report, right? You define what you need with some uh, consultants on the back, and, and uh, McKinsey's not a bad example. No, no one's ever been fired for buying IBM. So uh, going to, the, to, to those ones will, will get you uh, your, your back covered. So that's when you start, then you start building. And as you build, as you pour in resources, the risk also mounts. So at the end, um, there's a lot at stake. And this is where typically, uh, what I witnessed myself was, you get these conference calls when you're, when you're around launch time and the, and the really tough decision making time. You get these conference calls with 15 people listening in. Or you get emails sent with 15 people CC, just to make sure that there are witnesses. Right? If this tanks, you are also part of this. So it's not just my head on the line, you are also uh, part of this because you were silent. If you thought it wouldn't work, you should have spoken up. Uh, whereas the, um, the approach that you see in tech companies uh, is uh, agile. It's built around smaller iterative loops where every time you test something, you're actually um, uh, deflating risk. So whatever iteration you do has very little risk. And it also means that um, you can be more creative because whatever you think of, will not be able to hurt you that much if it fails. It's just the learning. I remember a specific example talking to a, a colleague in, in the farm industry 
um, about how this, we were talking about uh, uh, approval of content for marketing. And he mentioned this case where another company had had a campaign that completely backfired in Greece. Uh, the, the tagline was apparently ambiguous and had been misunderstood in Greece, so that they'd gotten what is, um, they'd gotten a shitstorm on social media. And, and as he was saying that, I, my thinking was, well, too bad they didn't iterate, too bad they didn't test this, so they actually see that response from just a thousand people, and they can kill that approach and go in a different direction. His thinking was, I'm glad I didn't decide on that campaign. So, so it's, a, it's a testimony to how much building risk will hurt your ability um, to test things out. And, uh, and the problem at the core of this is, this is very much a cultural issue, and I think it's probably the biggest issue in pharma, if you ask me. We've talked a lot about culture previously, we've talked about talent, but uh, this quote by Peter Drucker, I think, really is important because that is the hardest thing to change. You can buy technology, no problem. You can even, at some point, uh, recruit people. But if they end up in a situation, we heard that testimony uh, Christopher said uh, at the previous panel, if they're not integrated, if, if, they, if they land on um, dry ground, they're not gonna be able to, to, to work uh, properly and excel. So, so I think that's, that's at the core of the problem. And then um, fear of failing is, the, is a, a clear enemy of agility, and that's, well, that's me. That. You're supposed to laugh here. Yeah. That's a thank you. At least some of you politely laughed now. I'm glad. I know we're getting close to lunch. You will get something to eat in a, in a minute. Uh, anyway, let's 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 move on. So basically, what growth hack is all about is trying to find the fastest, cheapest way to test your hypothesis and realizing that everything is a hypothesis. This is another concrete example. We were talking about um, a content landing page for HCPs, and, um, and we'll talk about what kind of content should be in there, what kind of community or environment we're we going to create, full of interesting knowledge, uh, and then the VP in the room said, I think the company logo needs to be there because it's going to add credibility, and everyone clicked their heels and said, you're right, Mr. VP, why didn't I think so myself, what a brilliant idea, we'll add the logo. Fortunately enough, we decided, and we, that was with the um, Innovation Lab, as we were growth hacking, you know, uh, with everything we did, we decided, why don't we test it? Why don't we assume that having the logo there is just a hypothesis? And within two weeks, with a simple A-B test, we could see that the version, with nothing else changed than the added logo, performed remarkably less uh, uh, efficiently than the one without the logo. So, if you could imagine, if we'd continued spending money on version B, we would have just piled up expenses that, that there was no need to, to, to have. Um, what, what this uh, uh, testing hypothesis also helps is getting from one size fits all to, to relevance. Now this is uh, an example that I, I hear that from, from a lot of companies that um, because getting content approval takes very, very long, uh, they tend to, marketeers and people working with communication, tend to be afraid to kill darlings in their communication. So they might have five messages that they think would be good, and they're really reluctant to kill any one of them, because they know they don't have that many chances to test which one is the most efficient. So they'll just stuff everything in there, and they'll end up, and this is not, this is not something I'm thinking, it's not a, a, a fantasy of mine, it's actually a true case. 21 page PDFs as marketing material. I don't know how many of you can, can uh, recognize something similar, but it's definitely not uh, a very efficient type of communication and it's definitely not relevant. Uh, and what happens then is, um, uh, we, I was in a, I mentioned yesterday at the opening panel, I was in a, a, a panel at a webinar where all the participants were asked, how many iterations do you do on your marketing material a year? And as I mentioned yesterday, um, less than 30% had more than uh, two iterations uh, per year. So what happens at the end when you do your after actions report after six to 12 months, what happens? Well, what worked and what didn't work, we don't know. So what we do next, probably the same. So you're gonna end up with no iterations at all, no change in your communication, and worst of all, no knowledge about what actually sticks with, uh, with the target audience. 
Whereas if you're using uh, the, the, the hypothesis testing approach, um, you can reach a lot of iterations very quickly. So I'm just uh, letting you know as a, as a uh, comment on the site, Hank needs to catch a plane. It's not because he thinks I'm really, really boring. It's not only because he thinks I'm boring to listen to, but I know that he needs to catch a flight. Uh, the people from the front are, are leaving now. Hope that's all. Um, so anyway, uh, using the iterative approach, you'll get to know a lot more about what sticks with, the, with your target audience and, and, and adapt your communication uh, accordingly. And uh, in a digital environment, it's not unusual to be able to have hundreds of iterations uh, every month. In fact, if you look to companies like Facebook, um, they say, Mark Zuckerberg himself says that what he's most prou proud about with Facebook is that at any given time, they have 10,000 different versions of Facebook Live. So they're capable of managing 10,000 different versions of their product uh, simultaneously. Um, another big difference with uh, the growth hacking approach compared to traditional approach is there are no silos. Uh, you don't have uh, marketing pointing to sales and sales pointing back saying the leads you send us a crap. Uh, marketing pointing to sales saying you can't sell uh, to save your lives. Because here you've got trackability and accountability all the way through the funnel. Um, uh, as a quick example, when I was a managing director of a music streaming service, we could see that the Facebook campaign we had that converted the best in the first instance, so the ones that had, the, the campaign that had the highest click-through rate on Facebook was a campaign with album covers of the 80s. So old bastards like me would see it and remember the time when they left high school, which is sad enough where all of us stop evolving culturally. Uh, and probably recognize that if you look into your consumption of music, not much has changed since the year 2019. Um, so, so we saw that converting really, really well in the first instance. But what we also saw was none of them became subscribers. Because they just responded to something they recognized and felt good about, but they weren't in the market for streaming. They had the CD collection. They, we just reminded them to go back and pick out the CD and listen to it once again. They didn't become customers of ours. And if we'd had the silos, we would have said to sales, listen, we send you the most eager uh, uh, leads we could ever find. Uh, but in reality, they were crap. This involves a multitude of different disciplines. I'm not going to go too much into this, but basically talking about talent, this is a different breed of talent that we're looking at. Uh, the growth hackers are very much T-shaped profiles. They could do a lot of different things. Um, and, and they're not quite like any marketing uh, uh, professionals used in other industries, and particularly not in, in pharma, I would say. So what kind of hurdles do we have uh, do we face in, in trying to adapt to this uh, rapid iteration approach to, to our communication? Well, first of all, we need to be able to, to make uh, a lot of different versions. And that means uh, we need to use paid media, otherwise we won't be able to A-B test. We won't be able to test out the same communication in 10 different variations um, if we do it using a platform where uh, volume is low, we can only update once a day or once a week. Um, and secondly, we need to make sure that we've got a fast track in, in approval of content. And, and uh, uh, this is a very important point. If you look at uh, how lawyers and, and any uh, legal person is incentivized, they're incentivized in pharma to, to keep you out of trouble. And the best way to do that is to do nothing, or at least do nothing new. So, so it's important to keep in mind that there needs to be a change in mindset for the approval process of the content. And, um, and uh, the, the, the argument will be had that, uh, well, we need to make sure that it's, it's uh, uh, compliant, but there's a, there are loads of ways to optimize this process. We saw previously one of the earlier speakers talking about how to do uh, modules in, in that uh, uh, content approval, but we also see a lot of cases where unbranded content that just has regular disease information is still going through the same approval process, long and tedious approval processes uh, uh, as branded content is. And then of course you need to, with all these different experiments, you need to be very, very disciplined when you design your experiments so you are sure that you can con uh, actually conclude something at the end. So, that was the growth hacking bit. Now on to machine learning in marketing. 
and uh, uh, if you play, yeah, so, so basically, um, machine learning marketing, I, I think, has a, has a lot of bearing in, um, in, uh, in pharma, because particularly in pharma, there's a lot of activities that we don't have the, the right attribution for. We don't actually know the attribution from uh, a lot of the material getting sent to, to reps, uh, sorry, uh, to, to ACPs, a lot of the meetings from, from reps, you can say that they're sales, but really they're communication or, or, or lobbying. We don't know those factors, and as Hank presented earlier, there, there, there's really a, a black box here. Um, and uh, I'll just give you a very quick example of, of how this is being used in general in, in marketing. We're starting to see that emerge quite a lot. It's important to see how much uh, during today and yesterday there's been talk about AI, but primarily in sales, it seems. Uh, but in other industries, we, we're, trying to, we're starting to see uh, machine learning being applied quite a lot in, in the marketing space. So this is a very simple example just to, to explain the principles. Uh, and please excuse me if it's uh, trivial to, to those of you who know uh, machine learning. But a simple way to use this is to look at linear regression. It's basically a statistical approach that will find the best match uh, in, in a plot of activities where you, where you see how sales activities have been impacted by a marketing initiative. And then you can make the best possible linear representation of those initi initiatives so you can predict if we spend this amount on that particular channel, how much will it yield? And you can do that then on multiple different uh, channels and find out which ones work the best. And you can even, with a very, very high uh, statistical accuracy, you can even make uh, a combination. So virtual, um, uh, virtual uh, features you can put in. So let's say uh, this one would make you think, well, we'll just stick to TV because that's the most efficient. But in reality, this one shows that the combination of radio and TV is actually more efficient than TV alone. So you can use that to predict which, is, which will be the winning formula going forward. As you can see, I don't know if you noticed, but this black box is so secretive that it actually removed the box. Uh, the fault of mine. Okay. Uh, what's different about previous approaches to, to, um, to using statistical models to predict the, the activity or the, the impact of activities is that this happens in a, in a repetitive learning loop. So every time something, uh, an activity has panned out and we know the results, that's fed into the machine to help it optimize for future predictions. So let's look at the hurdles we have in this space. Well, we still have some of the same uh, hurdles like, like we did before, slightly probably emphasized. Uh, we, we still need uh, to be able to have variation in content, we definitely need a, a pragmatic fast track because uh, this is going to imply quite a few different variations So we need to make sure that we don't slow all this uh, uh, computational power down by our own processes. Um, and then we also definitely need to worry about the experiments. So the so one thing uh, which is important to notice here is with AI, as it's continuously learning, uh, we need to make sure that we that we um, control it in the right way, so it doesn't learn something it shouldn't have learned. Um, and that's, that's uh, also one of the reasons why FDA and EMA are really cautious about how to, how to um, approve artificial intelligence, because what if it learns something wrong? How do you monitor and register and control something that's not static? So that's something definitely to keep in mind. And then we're seeing something else in this case, which comes back to what's been mentioned previously around uh, um, the, the, the competencies available to pharma. And I think that this is, uh, coming back to the cultural issue, this is a really big hurdle to overcome. Can you actually recruit the talent you need for this kind of activity? Uh, data scientists are probably the most sought after um, capacity at the moment. So they can pick and choose between any sexy company out there, uh, at least the best ones. So can we offer them, uh, and is this not about the paycheck? In fact, for millennials, it's, it's uh, much more than that. Can we offer them an environment where they will thrive? Can we offer them um, uh, a position where their manager will understand uh, their competencies and, and uh, the, the, what they are able to bring to the company? I think that's actually at the heart of the problem. Can you change the culture and can you bring in uh, fresh new blood 
to, uh, to the company. Um, and that's uh, the clicker works. That would bring me to, if it works, my final slate saying thank you. There we are, thank you. <laughs>